gentlemen, welcome to the joint press briefing following the, the second session of the informal meeting of the Minister and State Secretary for European Affairs. The Romanian Minister Delegate for European Affairs, George Chamba, together with the first Vice President of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, will present you the results. Unfortunately, Commissioner Ottinger could not make it uh, to the meeting because uh, his flight got cancelled uh, due to bad weather and he sent you his regrets. I will now give the floor to Minister George Chamba. Minister, please. Bună ziua and bine, și bine ați venit la declarația de presă de astăzi. Good morning, welcome to today's press conference. As you well know, we are organizing today the informal meeting of ministers and state secretaries for European Affairs. This is the usual informal meeting during a presidency of the Council. The purpose is to facilitate informal debates on several horizontal issues uh, in the remit of uh, this uh, council. O prima sesiune care s-a referit la Our first session referred to the multiannual financial framework. Then we had a working lunch with the representatives of the Parliament on how to carry forward negotiations on the future budget of the EU. We have already obtained some results. As the beginning of our mandate, we have assumed that the next multiannual financial framework will be one of the key files for us. Uh, since the first weeks of our presidency, we have started work building on the pivot political guidance provided by the European Council in December 2018. And I want to emphasize that without uh, result, or results of the Romanian presidency, we cannot achieve the end result in the fall of 2019. What we have focused on is um, advancing the negotiation in the Council and with the European Parliament on as many as possible sectoral proposals before the European elections. And uh, this was the reason as well to have the European Parliament in the morning with us. I think we are asking to open more trialogues when it comes to the sectoral proposals. We have been able to close so far four of them. Uh, in the same time, um, uh, before our four, uh, we wanted to have them in order to hear their views. And it was very important to have an exchange of views because at the end of the day, the multi-financial framework is going to be so, uh, put together by the three institutions, by the European Parliament, uh, by the Commission, and by the Council. We had a good discussion today, I should say. You, you, you can watch very easily the discussions on the MFF. There are public debates when it comes to the General Press Council, and we are going to have another one just in a couple of, in one week time. But I think it was important that in this kind of informal setting, very, uh, we understood clear which are the red lines and how we can proceed in order to uh, achieve and to have results. Oh, in the, yesterday we had the enlargement. Ieri am vorbit despre lărgirea Uniunii Europene, cred că un proiect Yesterday we talked about enlargement. This is a very important project for Romania. A stadiul în care stau cele cinci stadiul în care sunt relații europene cele cinci candidate, uh, mai ales în momentul countries. în care uh, toată lumea este entuziasmată de, is, uh, de ceea ce înseamnă ceea ce înseamnă uh, puterea uh, Uniunii Europene. So that uh, everybody is now enthusiastic uh, about the soft power of uh, the EU. It is very important, of course, uh, that we live up to our promises, of course, uh, on condition that candidate countries uh, fulfill their requirements. What is important uh, is that uh, we get some momentum during the Romanian presidency and uh, possibly start negotiations uh, with Macedonia, Northern Macedonia and Albania. Other countries uh, are already negotiating their accession, but what is important is uh, to also calibrate our relationship with Turkey and uh, on the 15th of March we will have an association agreement meeting with Turkey. In the second session we discuss the strategic agenda of the Union. I think this is all three subjects, enlargement, strategic agenda, 
and the last one are interconnected we cannot you know one of the uh, we, what it means discussing about the strategic agenda first of all it means to take stock and to see which were the policies that were successful for uh, for the union and for Romania this uh, decide is very decisive to say that enlargement is uh, one of the successful policies is both about bringing more stability in the area and as well uh, you know uh, enhancing the single market this is work for Romania it worked so well from the point of view of growth economic growth and well welfare and well-being so I think it's one of the policies that Romania it's a real champion of. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the, uh, the strategic agenda. Normally, you know, you cannot do a budget without first having the lines and the directions. So in a way, this is why I think the discussion on the budget and on the MFF is so much linked with the strategic agenda because, you know, we have to see how the union is adapting itself to the challenges of, the, of, the, of today, which are different than uh, when it was the case for the last strategic agenda of the Union. It's very important that the Union you know, gives, uh, uh, gives a financial toolbox that, first of all, has the flexibility to respond to the challenges of, of today, but in the same time, it gives a toolbox that responds to the priorities and uh, or, or the places that you know, Europe should do more. I am speaking about research, about development, about about digitalization, about uh, artificial intelligence, about all these areas that should be better reflected in the next budget of the Union. In the same time, uh, this should be clearly reflected in the strategic agenda. You know, as you all well know, uh, first discussion on the agenda is going to be in the summit in Sibiu. The agenda is going to be, the strategic agenda of the Union should be adopted by the leaders in the European Council in the month of June. And of course, everybody, the other, the other thing that everybody is waiting for is, you know, news from London, but this, I think, is going to be after we end our meeting. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister Chamba. Vice President Timmermans, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I want to start by thanking George and the Romanian Presidency for this opportunity in an informal setting to discuss the future of our European Union. I think it is very important if at some point we will have to find a compromise uh, between all these member states with different ideas about the multi-annual financial framework, the European Parliament and the Commission. Um, and I think it is one of the most complicated operations ever. Um, it's always been complicated, the MFF, but this time, of course, with one of our member states and Annette contributor to the EU budget leaving the European Union and at the same time you see all sorts of new challenges coming towards the European Union. The complexity of this operation is really um, uh, uh, quite a challenge to everyone. But at the same time we all know that at the end of the day we will find a compromise, we will find a way forward. And I believe um, uh, the discussion today can help clarify the position of the member states and of the institutions. We had a very useful meeting with the representatives of the European Parliament uh, this morning. It can also clarify where the main priorities lie for the years to come. I think um, the uh, process of selecting five um, main priorities, uh, what, what was done five years ago with the Juncker Commission, the European Parliament and the European Council, the 10 main uh, areas of focus. That process was validated. I think it did work very well. Uh, and at the same time, we, know, we all know that you have this process of identifying your priorities on the basis of where you think the European Union should be going. And at the same time, you have to be ready to act when there are new challenges that reality throws at you. And we've seen that in the last years, the biggest challenge that was thrown at us that we had not anticipated in this dimension was the migration challenge. And we responded to that, I think, in a very adequate way. And so if you devise a budget for the future, a multi-annual financial framework for the future, you have to make sure you have the means to address your priorities, but you also have to make sure you have the flexibility to react to events, to react to new challenges that you perhaps cannot always foresee. And that is the Commission's uh, position in this uh, discussion. And, um, you know, I especially call on member states who... Um, are a bit wary to, um, to, to uh, 
come to terms with the need for flexibility, call on them to look at it again in light of the challenges uh, we have had to face in the last five years. Um, and I want to echo what George said also about preparing ourselves for CBU and the discussion there on what the priorities will be uh, for uh, the future. Um, this is still before the European elections. And then, of course, the European elections will have um, a, a strong effect on the choices we will make after that, because the new European Parliament will want to also state its case. The European Parliament is an institution of great importance uh, for the strategic choices we make. The European Commission, the new European Commission, will depend on a majority in the European Parliament to get its um, uh, proposals adopted. And also the Council of Ministers representing the member states will depend on the European Parliament as co-legislator to make things happen after the election. So we're all preparing for a future that will be challenging but also promising. We have to make sure that the European Union is in a position, both internally and externally, to respond to the challenges, to use the opportunities, to make a success of the fourth industrial revolution, to make sure Europe prepares for a sustainable future, to make sure we are strong enough to face the challenges that Russia and China and other parts of the world throw at us. And these informal meetings, such as today, do help us to prepare for that. And once again, I'm very grateful to the Romanian presidency for having given us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Timmermans. We will take now um, uh, four questions, uh, two from the national press and uh, two from international press. So I will start from there. Please. Ladies first. Hello, Carmen Gavila, The Public Radio. I have a question for you, and if you both please uh, answer it. Uh, what are the chances for the Nago Box to be completed by uh, the summit in June? Thank you. The Nago Box for the MFF. No, this is what we are working on, I think, uh, and this is where we can find agreement. I think, you know, we'll be coming in April, I think, with a sort of revised negotiation box that would take into account what we heard here, what we heard in each of the sessions of the General Affairs Conference. Plus, of course, what we are hearing on technical level. I think we are focusing a lot on the technical level because we think that, first of all, we have to go through the technical level and before we touch the political decision time. But I think the other thing is even more important because this is really a deadline. The deadline is the term in office of the European Parliament. So we, uh, we, the sectoral proposals, how many we are going to be able to close during the term of in office, these are going to be the ones that are going to be really the footprint of the Romanian presidency. We know from, from the Commission we have a um, very strong belief in the ability of the Romanian presidency to deliver. Um, and I think uh, the facts uh, demonstrate this. Uh, this presidency has been extremely successful in closing a lot of issues that were still on the table. Uh, I want to mention one that was uh, decided last night between the co-legislators on whistleblowers. This is really, you know, groundbreaking stuff. Uh, and thanks to the Romanian presidency, we bring this uh, to, to a good end. And so I, I honestly believe that if there's one presidency that can, you know, create the momentum so that we can move forward also on the MFF, it is the Romanian presidency. Thank you. The other question there. Uh, from the press agency, I have a question about Brexit for uh, both the Minister Chamba and First Vice uh, President Timmermans. Some British MPs said that the latest agreement be uh, between uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and uh, Theresa May brings little to no change to either the exit agreement or to the uh, future uh, uh, relations. What's your take on this? And uh, what do you think are the best and worst scenarios if the British MPs uh, vote down the deal today? Thank you. No, I already responded at the doorstep. I think we are keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, I think we hope that uh, you know, we, Europe has shown the will of compromise and the member states showed both unity and will of compromise. And we hope this is going to help. But the vote belongs to the British Parliament. I think the European Commission over the last two years has done everything humanly possible to make sure that Brexit uh, does as little harm as possible to all sides. Um, the British people have decided to leave the European Union. We need to respect 
that decision, even if it makes me unspeakably sad, frankly. Uh, but that's a decision taken by the British people. And, and I think we, as European politicians, have a very strong responsibility to make sure we do as little harm as possible. And I, I honestly believe the withdrawal agreement is the best possible outcome, uh, given the circumstances and the political realities in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I honestly believe that uh, Jean-Claude Juncker made an incredible effort last night to also accommodate um, uh, the latest requirements uh, from uh, the British government. And now it's up to uh, the House of Commons to decide in a meaningful vote. But I think, you know, um, um, the responsibility we felt as European Commission and the responsibility which we dealt with over the last uh, two years was huge. Um, and I have to say that um, uh, what uh, Jean-Claude Juncker did last night in an effort to make sure that we don't do as little harm as possible in this process, what he did last night, I think is of great importance. And I do hope this is also seen as such by the members of the House of Commons. Thank you. There, please. Uh, Alina Epimie from uh, Romania TV. I have a question for both, if it's possible. Um, in the context of the challenges faced by the European Union, um, move, uh, street movements, uh, migration or terrorism, uh, how do you see the future of the U European Union? Yeah, no, actually, it's, this is part of the challenges, and this is what we are discussing. But in a way, you know, what uh, I should say, one of the things that we should take as a lesson learned from both the migration crisis and the sovereignty debt crisis is that Europe all the time find the ways and means to uh, adjust itself. And I, I should say that, you know, uh, we are not anymore in a migration crisis. Of course, migration is a political subject. But I think we have, uh, Europe was able to overcome the migration crisis, and uh, the same could, could be said about how Europe went out of the sovereign debt crisis. Because, you know, it's, at that time it looked as well very unexpected. There were things unexpected. We, we didn't have the toolbox. This is why we want to make the strategic agenda better. This is why we want to make the multi-financial framework better. Because we have to be better equipped the next time when it's going to come. But even if with, the, if, with a more, so to say, rigid type of institutional approach, we have been able to, to do and to, to, to get out of it and I think to respond with efficiency and in the same time, uh, you know, to, uh, still to stick together. I think unity is important. Brexit is proving that we, are, you, we can be united and I think this is another lesson learned that should be taken from all the crises of Europe, that Europe can, uh, at the end of it, gets out more united and more cohesive. Well, I think it's fair to say, if you look at the results of the multiple crises we have faced, is that Europe uh, and it, most of its member states have come out of this crisis with more inequalities, with more problems especially in the social field, with more citizens dissatisfied with the situation, with more citizens worried about their future. And there are certain areas where the future of our citizens can only be served if we act together as Europeans. Uh, I, I strongly believe in a Europe that concentrates on added value at the European level, things that can be dealt with by our member states or even by local communities and regions should be left there. But certain things we need to tackle at the European level. Um, if we want to make Europe a more just place, if we want to make the internal market a place where there are fair wages, where there is far less youth unemployment, which is still a huge problem, where jobs are more secure, when salary, where salaries are more equal, we have to look at European measures. We have to elaborate on the pillar of social rights, which I think is one, uh, the social pillar is one of the uh, uh, biggest achievements in the last couple of years, but we have to expand on that. We also have to make sure that, um, you know, uh, companies who make profits in Europe actually also pay taxes in Europe. It's, it's, I think, you can't explain to a citizen that these huge multinational corporations make huge profits in Europe and pay no taxes. And only Europe can help member states solve that problem. So there are many areas where I believe our citizens are dissatisfied with the present situation, but more so are worried about the future. And if Europe is not part of the answer, Europe will stay part of the problem. 
So Europe will also be uh, uh, called upon to contribute to finding solutions for social challenges, for unemployment, for inequalities, for unfair taxation, and these should be the priorities also uh, in the years to come. And the last question, here. Uh, Nick Thorpe from the BBC. A question for Mr Timmermans, again on Brexit. Um, you spoke of the incredible effort made by Mr Juncker last night. If that, couldn't that incredible effort have been made before? Had those reassurances um, been offered beforehand, couldn't some of the anguish of the past weeks and months have been avoided? And if those reassurances were offered before, what's actually new in what was offered last night? Well, first of all, the withdrawal agreement previously um, uh, achieved was a withdrawal agreement that had the support of the British government. Uh, and then it was defeated in the House of Commons. So then the House of Commons had uh, uh, questions about and asked some clarifications, especially about uh, the backstop. And the Commission worked very hard to make sure we could give these clarifications. And Jean Claude Juncker, I, did, I think, gave these last night, and an agreement was reached. So I think that is the change vis a vis the earlier withdrawal agreement. Um, but sometimes I think it, it's forgotten that there was an agreement, and the agreement was reached with the British government, only defeated in the House of Commons. Now we hope this. Uh, clarification and improvement on uh, the uh, backstop issue uh, would help uh, to uh, carry a majority in the House of Commons, but we will have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see uh, what um, uh, Mr. Cox um, uh, um, says about this. We'll have to wait and see what the House of Commons says about this, and we'll take it from there. It's not in our hands anymore. It's in the hands of the House of Commons now. Minister Chamba, um, Vice President Timmermans, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. The press briefing ends here. Thank you. Thank you.